And we want to welcome you to the Martin Luther King Morning Program 2018. Our theme this year is now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. We're here today to honor the life and legacy of a great and loving human being, Martin Luther King. I am grateful that he came to be with us for a time. I am grateful that he heard and responded generously to the call of the great mystery to teach us again how we are supposed to behave as human beings. It goes beyond democracy, it goes beyond any kind of governance that we can imagine. It's just to be human beings in a good way. Apparently, Creator must have great patience with us because over the generations, in all places, these great teachers keep coming to us. In order to prosper as creatures on this earth, we must act towards all other two-leggeds and all of creation with respect, generosity, humility, and compassion. The legacy of Dr. King shows us that we can do this. It's not just pie in the sky, we can. Whether it is at the poles or at Selma or at Standing Rock or on the coast here where we need to protect what is coming down. We can do this. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. A big thank you to the Shumash family singers. And we trust the songs they sang and the words that were spoken. You heed it and take it to heart. That support of building the beloved community that Dr. King spoke of. I would like to share um, some words to commemorate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Twelve years ago this spring, in an outdoor breezeway on a high school campus in Santa Barbara, hundreds of students of color walked out of school and walked onto the street. The goal was to walk the seven miles to Santa Barbara City Hall by walking to the symbolic center of our local government. They would let their voices be heard locally in their fight back against a national anti-immigration bill that they felt criminalized them and their families. After their long trek and many moments of resigned and regained faith, they arrived at the steps of City Hall only to find something they did not expect. The entrance to the symbolic center of local government was sentinels by two armed police officers. But in an instance, the students' dismay turned into delight as the mayor of the city stepped through the doorway to welcome and congratulate them on their civic action and courage. In weeks after this action, the students continued their push for change. They gained audiences with local officials and spoke at local high school board meetings talking about the criminalization of immigrants and the outright segregation they saw in their local schools in the hope that the national discussion on immigration would lead to some local changes. 
Many of these young activists were my students. They learned many lessons from the preparation, the carry out, and the aftermath of their political action. One lesson they learned was that they had the ability to speak against the law they saw, that they saw as unfair. As their teacher, I also learned lessons. I learned that these students were extraordinary. To, to understand this, let us consider for a moment that these actions taken by these high school students were done in the face of marginalization. These students' ideas and experiences were not always welcomed or valued in the classroom or by our educational institutions. In fact, most were tracked into classes that were deemed less desirable. In the face of this marginalization, these students did not give up on our democratic ideals. As time passed, they began to learn another political lesson. This time, it was a hard political lesson. The seeming empathy of local administrators and local government officials that they encountered when they attended the forums and the school board meetings was not empathy, but more of a sympathy. As we know, in the political arena, even a well-meaning sympathy rarely brings about change. This group of students who walked out over a decade ago were not the first group to engage in this political strategy and are not the last. Just, just last year, students again marched out of our local secondary schools in protest of our elected president's threats and cruel and hateful language. Aside from their unrelenting optimism in a system that has done them wrong, what else can we learn from these students? We can learn that the nonviolent political strategy they used did not come from the founding fathers' idea of freedom. The ideas of freedom within the democracy that was in place at the founding of the United States allowed for the founding fathers lusting after indigenous lands. It allowed for the dehumanization and enslavement of vast amount of people through chattel slavery and indentured servitude. It allowed for the regulation of women to limited gender roles which translated into limited political and economic rights. No, the students' nonviolent political actions came from a radical democratic tradition. A radical democratic tradition led by African Americans in their struggle for freedom. Led by leaders like W.E. Du Bois, A. Phil a. Philip Randolph, Fannie Lou Hamer, Malcolm X, and, Dar and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This radical democracy has the ability to push the founding fathers towards equity and equality. This democracy has the ability to reinvent the United States. The historian Robin D.G. Kelly explains, radical democracy is manifest in the struggles of the dispossessed to overturn the Eurocentric, elitist, patriarchal, and dehumanizing structures of racial capitalism and its liberal underpinnings. It is manifest in the struggle to restore the commons to the commonwealth. The struggle to restore the commons to the commonwealth can be seen in today's launching of a new, a new poor people's campaign by modern day civil rights leaders. Inspired by King's historic 1968 action, which was led by King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It could also be seen in the words of Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator and philosopher who was a leading advocate of critical pedagogy. He prods us to action by stating, one's, washing one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means to side with the powerful and not to be neutral. This leads us to ask, if now is the time to make real the promise of democracy, how do we make it real? We make it real by acknowledging that radical democracy is necessary but is not enough. Radical democracy is necessary but is not enough. It is not enough because it needs to be coupled with a new understanding of the damage that our president democracy has created and is creating for many at home and abroad. Look at the recent attacks on the Civil Rights Act 1964 and on the Voting Rights 
uh, Rights Act, Act and Immigration Act and Nationally Act of 1965. Look at the police violence against young men of color and the fallout of that police violence. Look at the incredible amounts of gender violence. Look at the rising military nuclear threats. Look at the growing gap between those with material wealth and those without it. We must unmask the foundations of our present unequal democracy in order to truly address the issues of violence, inequality, and disenfranchisement. In this way, the promise of democracy is not a promise from our government to us, but a promise within ourselves to take nonviolent action in the face of continued injustice and violence. It is a promise to the four freedoms that were originally de de delivered by President Roosevelt in the State of Union Address on January 6, 1941, and later expanded upon by President Lyndon Johnson in 1968. It is a promise to take the freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear from a private or individual realm to the public realm being enjoyed by all. Finally, it is a promise to commemorate the life and work of Martin Luther King Jr. from this moment forward. To commemorate the universal, unconditional love, forgiveness, and nonviolence that empowered his revolutionary spirit by making real a radical democratic movement that finds a way for all of us to survive and dares to help all of us to win. Thank you, Mr. Estrada. I know you all realize this is not a church service, but I can't help myself. I have to say amen, amen, and amen. We all can be a part of building that beloved community that Dr. King spoke of. And if you take Mr. Strata's words to heart, you will be a part of that. We have some of our local representatives in the audience, and we are going to ask a couple of them if they would come up and share a word with you. Uh, first, we're going to ask our assembly woman, Monique Lennon, and after that, we're going to ask Mr. Gary Hart, city council member, if he would come up and have a word also. Today, we honor the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I also ask that we take a moment to honor the recent lives that were taken by the storm. During this time of healing from the devastation of natural disasters and the aggressions from other parts of our nation, it is more important to embrace one another as we restore our personal and emotional health. Dr. King, is one of the most inspiring and influential leaders in history. The importance of celebrating, of gathering, to recognize his vision, his dreams for equality, his leadership, his work around human rights, and his nonviolent mission to end segregation is more significant now than ever. This year's theme for our Martin Luther King celebration locally is, now is the time to make the real promises of democracy. <laughs> Carlos just reminded us about what that real promise looks like, feels like, and should be in our community. Thank you, Carlos.
Martin Luther King became an advocate of change and his powerful words resonate with us today. Dr. King's life was devoted to the wellness and betterment, not only of the underrepresented, but also the rights and freedom of humanity as a whole. When we think about what now is the time to make the real promises of democracy looks like, we remember that we have a power, we have the power and the responsibility to fulfill Dr. King's missions. We have the power and the responsibility to ensure that our nation is free of discrimination and oppression. That our nation is one where our dreamers can find a pathway to permanency in our community. That our, rec that our nation recognizes that black lives matter. That our nation takes the teaching of our ancestors, the Shumash and others, to respect and preserve our natural environment. That the, our nation respects religious freedoms. Dr. King taught us that leadership and passion can unite millions, and it has. It is crucial that we join in forces to work together towards Dr. King's mission. To honor his legacy, we must ensure the progress that we have made continues moving forward. Thank you so much for being here today and thank you again to the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee for organizing and allowing us this space to strengthen our community. It's great to have our community leaders to come out to participate in our program. And our program would not be complete if we didn't have our honorable mayor to say a word. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm still recovering from our vigil last night. I know a lot of you were out there. We really needed that, didn't we? To have a sense of healing and togetherness. People had been wandering around with a lot of different kinds of feelings. Thank goodness we were there. I wanted to add some comments to the keynote speaker on the topic of youth empowerment. Uh, here at City Hall, we support the Ethnic Studies Now program. And so the struggle continues, right? We want a high school graduation requirement where our young people have to learn about racial justice, black history, Native American history, what really happened. There's some different stories, aren't there, aren't there, folks? And we want the truth. We want our young people to know the truth. So I've already had meetings with youth. I, I want you to know the door is open to our Chumash. We got that Standing Rock uh, resolution passed uh, to support the tribe against the Dakota Access Pipeline. So the door is open to the Chumash. The door is open to the youth. The door is open to everyone. And in a very practical sense, I have the key in case anybody needs to use the bathroom this morning. All right, I'm your mayor. <laughs> I think Greg Hart is next. Well, welcome to Santa Barbara's front porch. <laughs> De La Guerra Plaza has been the site of many community events, uh, tragic ones, joyful ones. Um, everything that's happened in Santa Barbara started here in this plaza. This tree has provided shade for hundreds of years and many, many people have come here together to express their, their joy and their sadness depending on the occasion. And here today, we, I'm sure all of you, I know I am feeling both. This is an incredibly difficult time for our community, but the strength of democracy and the strength of our community is our togetherness. Dr. King's work, all of our work in government and politics and in, in advancing social change is about bringing people together and recognizing our strength as a community. More than ever today, it's important for us to gather. 
Uh, the tragedy that's occurring and, and, and continuing in Montecito is one of the worst things that's ever happened to our community. We would normally watch walk up State Street together, uh, but the police officers that would help us clear the path are working diligently in Montecito to save people and to protect houses and, and our community. They're working 24-hour shifts beyond the police officers and the firefighters and the first responders. Your government employees are working 24-hour shifts to keep all of the services that we depend on as a community working, the wastewater, the water, all of the services. There's an emergency operations center up at the county that has staff from every agency in the South Coast and state officials, federal officials, all gathering to keep our community together and to bring all the resources that we have to bear to begin the recovery process. Let's thank them for their work. But we all have a role to play in this recovery too and, and we're all feeling different emotions and the vigil last night was extremely helpful to get people together to recognize that each of us our own, on our own timetable on our own path will feel different emotions and, and that, is, that is what you need to do. You need to, to let that happen. But I was struck by something that Supervisor uh, Williams said at the beginning of the vigil last night. He talked about the fact that the courthouse is built on the rubble from the 1925 earthquake. And from that tragedy, Santa Barbara was reborn. There's also a saying on one of the arches at the courthouse that said, God gave us the natural beauty of this community, but the men and women here built this town. It's up to us to gather together to rebuild our town and it starts here and it starts now. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Mr. Hart. When I uh, looked out, I didn't see one of our newest council members, Eric Freeman. Well, thank you, Isaac. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here with all of you uh, and with you last night at, at the vigil. Um, I just want to say that uh, when we, when we consider what we're going through, I want to recognize uh, the fact that one of my closest and oldest friends that I've known since I was about this tall, uh, his name is Sammy Rodriguez, and he's a firefighter. We grew up in Lompoc together, and he's been there the whole week. Uh, my wife is a first generation. Uh, her, last name, her name is Julie Nguyen, and uh, Vietnamese, and she's been pulling 10, 14 hour shifts at the hospital uh, to deal with this tragedy this week. And we have my, our two sons over there who are, uh, sitting over there playing nicely together. And, and, I, uh, and I bring this up because uh, we're, we're one community and, and, uh, and we're coming together and we're of all colors, we're of all backgrounds, and we're really united and we will be united going forward. And it's days like these that we come together day by day. So we had the vigil last night and each day is a new day, a new challenge. And coming here, all of you uh, just uh, warms our hearts and we're together. And after the vigil last night, I, I want to recommend this. I, I went home and, and just needed to kind of tune out a little bit. It was a very emotional day. It started at Mass at the Mission uh, with Archbishop Jose Gomez. I, coming in from Los Angeles, had to take a helicopter to get here, and, and it started just an emotional day for all of us. And I, I ended it by uh, finding on Netflix, uh, David Letterman has a new show, and, and his first interview was uh, with the real president, Barack Obama. <laughs> And, uh, and I, I, miss, I miss Obama, and I know we all do. And uh, part of the, the interview was also with uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, that David Letterman did, and he did it out on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And in light of uh, today honoring uh, the road that uh, Dr. King has paid for us, that we all continue to walk, uh, I, I encourage you all to watch that. Uh, it's very insightful uh, with the President and, and Congressman Lewis. And uh, it, it will warm your heart, but it will also know that we have a lot of work to do. Uh, but we're going to do it together just like last night and today. Thank you for this time together. Thank you, Councilman Freeman. As our community is going through one of the most difficult times we've ever experienced, what brings us hope is community, the gathering of people and the sense of everybody doing what we can. Um, if there's ever been a time that's called to us, I think a lot of people are feeling that. And 
when I think about Dr. King and his legacy, it's so important that we all think about how all of us work together, whether it's with nonviolence, um, working towards justice. And when I think about the rebuilding, the recovery process ahead, I know that we will all stand strong together. We will rise. We will stand together. We will rise. Thank you. Hi, good morning everybody. My name is Ethan Bertrand. I'm the board president of the Isla Vista Community Services District. Isla Vista is, thank you. Isla Vista is newly formed local government. And I'm proud to be up here as a black man. I'm proud to be up here as a Latino man. I'm proud to be up here as a gay man. A lot of identities that have been under attack this year. When I was growing up, um, recently, I, I was asked about uh, what marginali marginalization have you faced? And I really thought back to my childhood where I didn't see a future where I could go on into a leadership position. I didn't see a clear pathway for a life where I could uh, go and really excel in a field and, and serve others. And that's from different biases that we encounter as people of color. That's from elected officials like the President of the United States currently people who disparage us in many ways. But one thing that we see here in Santa Barbara and one thing that we see throughout many other areas of the country are people coming together, people coming together to say that we are one, that we will advance equality and that we'll move forward in a way that lifts us all up um, to be the best that we can. So thanks so much for being every here, everybody, and happy Martin Luther King Day. Yeah. We want to thank all of our elected officials again for being a part of this program. And I'm sure that they are doing the best that they can to help build that beloved community that Dr. King spoke of. Thank you to Isaac and our dedicated officials. It's amazing to have such a great group. So uh, thank you all for being here today. I'm sure most of you were at the vigil last night. It was a powerful, powerful community experience. Uh, we are World Dance for Humanity. Most of you know us by now. We've been doing this a while. It's a great chance to come out here and, and uh, feel and be and do solidarity with each other and with you in our community and with the country on a day like today. As you, many of you know, we work in Rwanda. We work in Africa. So World Dance for Humanity, we have classes and everything that we do through our classes and everything else goes to help people in dire need these are victims of the genocide in Rwanda. So the people that we work with, when we met them some years ago, had no hope at all. We're talking a lot about hope today, about hope in our community, about hope with the civil rights movement way back when. We are feeling it and experiencing it a lot, very acutely. We just got back from Rwanda over Christmas. We, we packed to evacuate for the fires and packed for Rwanda at the same time. We left for Rwanda. We were there at a leadership training for our community of students there. When we met with the students, our leader over there, Justin Bisingamana, a fabulous Rwandan leader who has emulates um, Martin Luther King and uh, is an inspiring man. He, when we went there, started off our student training. He put, this is in Rwanda, in Shigali, couple, well, right around Christmas, he put a big uh, photograph of Santa Barbara in flames. We were shocked. We didn't know that's what he had planned, but he had, we had 170 of our Rwandan students there, and he said, here's Santa Barbara in flames. See these gals? They've come from Santa Barbara. They've left their town in flames to be here to be here with you, with your leadership training. We've uh, entrusted these young people in Rwanda to lead their communities out of poverty, and they have embraced it, they understand it, they're doing it, it was spectacular to be part of that. But the communities we're working with truly had nothing when we met them. No possessions, very little land, no animals for fertilizer. I mean, no way, no education, no training, no hope, more to the point. And we learn slowly as a group what it means to have no hope that you're going to survive. We were able to start working with them, and now these people have hope. And we've watched. We have been able to see the difference between having hope and having no hope at all, and that, and that path, that journey. No more our ancestors.
rules. Women are not a possession. Dr. Martin Luther King, he, he was the one who went to the mountaintop and saw the promised land and brought hope to our country, to the civil rights movement. You know that he gave that speech, the speech uh, about the mountaintop. He said, you know, I don't know how long I'll be here, but it's not bothering me. I'm not worried about longevity. Longevity is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. But I'm not worried about it. And he was killed the next day after he made that speech. He gave such hope through his example to all the people that followed him. They started really believing in community and solidarity and that, what that means. Now in our community, we have suffered. Everybody has been touched. Everybody has suffered in their hearts, whether they are part of the what's gone on with the fires or the mudslides. Lost people, had, had people involved in it. Everybody's affected. And we know from examples like like Dr. King, that it's solidarity and it's community and it's opening up to each other that brings hope. That's what we do with World Dance for Humanity. The, the disaster we've all experienced together has created a huge wound in our community and therefore it's, com it's, it's created an opening where compassion can come in, an opening, a wound. Let the compassion come in, turn to each other, help each other, open up, to each other and then to the world because there's a lot of pain and suffering out there and there's so much we can do. There is so much we can do to help people in our community and way beyond. for humanity. Again, we want to thank all of the participants in the program today. We also want to thank you, the audience. We're going to ask former council member, former mayor, Hal Cochran, to come up and give us a closing prayer. You can thank you to the Martin Luther King Committee I had the privilege as a young man uh, to work for Martin Luther King's organization, and uh, it was a tragic day on April 4th, 1968, when he was assassinated. But as he often said, the planting of seeds doesn't really have the ability to bear fruit until the seed drops to the ground. He was really quoting a biblical saying from Jesus, and it reminded me all the time that he wasn't just a civil rights leader, but he was a pastor. He was the pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. His father had been the previous pastor to that church, and he spoke not only in Montgomery and not only in Memphis and not only in Atlanta as a civil rights leader, but he spoke from the heart from what he knew and what he had learned in the family that he had grown up in. And that was a family of faith. He often said, Faith is the first step you take when you can't see the staircase. And I choose in my faith walk, he would say, to choose love. Because the alternative of hate is too great a burden to bear. And so in his honor, I think we come together today and we seek to commit ourselves to what it is that he committed to, and that is to be agents of reconciliation. It is only as we give ourselves and others in forgiveness, when we give ourselves and others in love, 
that true justice actually begins to occur. As he said, when the seed drops and it begins to grow, there is a transformation. Just as there is from a caterpillar to a butterfly, there's a metamorphosis that occurs in our life. And the metamorphosis that occurs in society is that justice doesn't occur on its own. It only occurs as the metamorphosis of love translates into justice. Because it's only then that you see the other person as your brother and your sister. It is only then that you actually empathize with them. And as Carlos said earlier, wherever Carlos is out here, empathy can easily turn to sympathy. And if I quote you correctly, sympathy often doesn't turn much to action. It is truly only as you give in love that justice begins to occur. So let us close with this blessing that really follows the tradition of Martin Luther King. Lord, ground of our being, the great power of the universe, which transforms us and can transform society. We give you our ability and our weakness that you can use our weakness to become strong. And in that strength, we'll become your agents of reconciliation. And we commit to that form of love. And in that name, we ask and we honor and we give you praise. Amen. that are here, 
of the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee. And thank you so much for sharing this with us today. Now I'd like to introduce again um, Isaac Garrett, who's our vice, uh, second vice president for the Martin Luther King Committee. And uh, I, some of you may know Isaac, he's been a part of our community for many years. Uh, he is a realtor and is, um, works for the Berkshire Hathaway um, Company and has been Realtor of the Year uh, and a lifetime membership as part of the realty community. He's also been involved with the Martin Luther King effort and uh, celebration in our community since its inception in 1986. He was a member of the first Martin Luther King Committee that we began then and had for approximately 10 years. He came again as a member of the organizing committee for our, our current uh, Martin Luther King Committee of Santa Barbara, and we're very happy to have him here with us, working all these 30 years uh, on behalf of Martin Luther King in Santa Barbara. Mr. Garrett. <laughs> And so John introduced me, it's an honor and a great privilege for me to introduce several of our local elected representatives to you. We are very fortunate to have our local representatives not only to represent us in their elected office, but to be strong supporters of the community events that bring our community together, like the Martin Luther King Jr. program today. The representatives you will hear from are out in the forefront, leading the charge, trying to bring our beloved community together and to make Dr. Martin Luther King's dream become a reality. The first speaker is a strong supporter and financial contributor to the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee and other local organizations that provide other services to the Santa Barbara community that governmental agencies do not have the financial resources to provide. Please welcome former first Santa Barbara County District Supervisor and current 24 Congressional Representative, Salute Cabajal. I want to thank the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee of Santa Barbara for organizing and hosting this event. It was a difficult year for many reasons, not, not all of them political. But certainly, most of the, the most difficult part was bearing witness to a revival, a racist sentiment that have, we've been fighting against for many years. We began last year with an air of uncertainty about our country's values. And while the ugly head of racism has made itself known most recently, a couple of days ago, again, Americans have and will continue to resist. Seeing the organizing happening, much of it following King's principles of nonviolence, brings relief, hope, and ever-present light that is needed to outshine the dark time. It is clear the fight for justice that Dr. King began decades ago is far from over, but we still must move forward. We must continue in this struggle for justice, equality, love, compassion. We must continue in this struggle for our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our brothers, our sons, our daughters, young, old, transgender, gay, straight, differently able, documented or undocumented. We must continue the struggle for this planet and for our humanity. That is why we are all here today. We believe in one another. We believe in our ability to drive out darkness in the hearts of those who wish ill upon us with the light that we foster within ourselves. Together that light is power and together we will overcome these times because we know it, what it takes to achieve our dream. My pledge to you is to continue to work in Washington with the light in my heart and with the tenets of nonviolence in mind to best serve you. 
Dr. King serves as an inspiration to live our lives as instruments of progress and change we need in our time so that we can leave our children and grandchildren a more perfect union on which to build on. Representative Steny Hoyer said in a statement today, let us remember that we cannot simply wait for these goals to be met, but, must, but we must meet them with our resolve. The mission to which Martin Luther King called all of us to conti continues so that we must continue to make it our own. This means standing up for social justice and economic justice by opposing policies by those that seek to undo our progress, like eroding our health care, imposing a partisan dangerous tax overhaul that forced the poor and those working hard to get by to subsidize massive tax cuts benefiting the wealthiest 1% and the multinational corporations in our country. And then we are surprised by the growing inequality in our country, I ask. It also means protecting the right to vote and combating poverty. We must stand shoulder to shoulder and speak out lo loudly more than ever against those and their efforts that seek to divide us, to undermine our civil rights, and going after the most vulnerable in our communities. Let's use our voice and not remain silent. Mr. Hoyer goes on to say, success in these efforts is never guaranteed, and progress only marches forward upon our own determined feet. So let us continue to take every step forward with a resolve, a resolute will, and to build on Martin Luther King's message. Let us bend the arc of the moral universe together through the strength of our persistent hands so that it inches closer to the justice we know and is not only possible but necessary, Mr. Hoyer states. Thank you for being here today and thank you for continuing to show up, organize, and resist. Thank you so much. Our next speaker has a long history of dedication and political leadership in trying to correct some of the political and economic ills in our society. She does not know how to quit. Will you please welcome our 19th Senatorial District Representative, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. things that I don't like about this particular venue is the lights are here and I can't see you. I know you can see me, but I can feel you. I can feel the energy as we, as we celebrate a man who was so extraordinarily inspirational, particularly to people of my generation. One of the greatest speeches of humanity ever given. Uh, on the, uh, in the halls of power in Washington, D.C. I have a dream. It is a dream that continues to this day because it hasn't yet come to fruition. But the inspiration of that man can and should never be forgotten. So I want to thank all of you for being here. What a pleasure and honor it is to again be here to celebrate one of the most extraordinary uh, men of, uh, of our of our community, of our country, of our world. And to consider his inspiration at this very significant and solemn time of mourning and reflection in our own community. Many of you were at the Sunken Gardens last night to share our grief and our anguish and our hope and our aspirations with thousands of other people in this extraordinary community who understand the importance of coming together to lift up our spirits as a collective, as human beings, as people who share in certain common values of dignity and respect for each other, and for those who are not quite as fortunate 
as we are to live in this extraordinary place. So we celebrate, and yet we also recognize that life is a challenge. And again, quoting the great Dr. King, who said, the ultimate measure of a man, and I will add, a woman, it is 2018, the ultimate measure of a man or a woman is not where he or she stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he or she stands during times of challenge and controversy. And we are in those times. And we will be measured by our ability to continue to resist hatred and bigotry and racism and misogyny, which have reared their ugly heads, sadly, almost inexplicably, right after the eight-year tenure of the first African-American president in the history of this nation. It is inexplicable, and yet we will not back down. It is hard to believe we find ourselves in times where civil and immigrant rights are under attack and that progress towards equality is being undermined. We have to stand strong to protect our values, our diversity. America is a quilt that of every nation, every culture, every belief, every language, every point of view, every value. That is America. That is our America. That is the America we dream about, the America Dr. Dr. King talked about and aspired to and lifted our voices to call out for. It is critically important that we recognize those rights, that we recognize the importance of our planet and the fact that it is only one planet and we will have only one opportunity to make it survive, to make it flourish. And if anyone doesn't think right now that Mother Nature is sending a message, we have not been kind and good to her, and it is time we turn that around. So we are here to celebrate Dr. King and to recognize his inspiration, his integrity, his commitment to the values that we share. And I can say with great pride that in California this year we had some great legislative wins for, because our leadership fought back against prejudice, against bigotry, against this kind of inexplicable fear and hate mongering that we are seeing now rejuvenate itself rearing its ugly head. We will not stand for that in California, and we will not stand for that in our own community. So my commitment to you, as our Congressman made his commitment to, to you as well, is that we will continue to ensure all Californians have access to justice, that our state laws are strong enough to withstand the threat of, to equality in the wake of continued threats, and that the civil and political rights of all Californians will be protected and upheld. And I will leave you with the great words of Dr. King, which you have heard, but we cannot hear them enough. And that is that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Thank you, Dr. King. Thank all of you for being here. stranger to you. I had never heard her name until about seven or eight years ago when she came on the political scene. But since that time, her name has become a household word. When you talk about commitment and dedication, she exemplifies it. Sometimes we say one person cannot or will not make a difference. The next time somebody tells you that, you ask them to look up the record of this person. I've seen the difference that she's made as a member of the Santa Barbara City Council. The people of this city will be the beneficiaries of her future leadership. And I'm talking about no one other than our new mayor, Maria, Kathy Maria.
nation, I'm honored and to have your respects for means so much to me. Thank you. I'm honored to be here today with you all. Um, as the other speakers have said, we faced so many challenges in the last year and in the last month. I can't believe I'm standing here all in one piece. Things have been so challenging. But thank you for having this event so we could come together. We need our community today. Even as we grieve the tragedies in Montecito, we can remember that on this day, on the day that we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy, that there's much work to be done to improve the human condition here in our community in Santa Barbara. Yes, looking, thank you. Looking at the national political arena, there is so much work to be done to create and maintain a just society for us all. I'm going to steal a line from my colleague, Eric Friedman, today. He spoke at the uh, Delegara Plaza. He said simply, I miss Barack Obama. <laughs> One of the things that I had to say today at the, at the plaza, and that was a beautiful uh, uh, series of activities and program, uh, thank you for that too, uh, was that I mentioned the ethnic studies uh, campaign here in Santa Barbara. There's a group of young people uh, led by a Chumash youth, and they want the high schools to require uh, for graduation, uh, participation, uh, com completing an ethnic studies class. So looking at yes. There's always several versions of history, right? Our children should know the truth about what happened to Native Americans and what happened to uh, African Americans and Africans. And if I, 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 I have a focus today on, on local activities if you're, if you're looking to get involved, so please look up the Ethnic Studies Now campaign. Um, I will continue my work with the pro-youth movement. Uh, our focus this year will be on academic achievement and job skills and job training. We need your help with that too. We're not helpless. Uh, if we don't like what's going on, uh, get active. And just before the Thomas fire started, the nonprofit Just Communities was convening meetings about a program to achieve racial equity. And that gathering was canceled because of the fire and the smoke. This was in mid-December, and it's been rescheduled to February. And I'm looking forward to that because I have been having meetings with Pastor Watkins and Brian Cox with the uh, Christ the King Episcopal Church on uh, reconciliation. And here, Just Communities is creating a venue for that and creating an opportunity. And I thank them for the good work that they do, looking at that most worthy goal. And they're not the only group. Also, the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee, the ADL, one of the sponsors of this uh, uh, event today, uh, the Jewish Federation, Casa de la Raza Cause, there's so many good groups that are trying to empower our youth so that they don't uh, suffer from racial oppression and stereotyping and that lack of expectation of them. We want our, all of our youth to do well in school. We, we want to help them fulfill their dreams. And that's the work that I'll continue to do as mayor. Um, I will give my personal time and my personal political power uh, to help our youth and to achieve social and economic justice in this city and in this region. I thank the committee for today's activities, and I have a favorite quote that I'll close with. I refuse to, this is Martin Luther King Jr. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. Let me say one last thing before I go. Today, finally, the authorities are taking me on a tour of the disaster area. We've been, I've stayed away from it. Uh, they didn't need a politician walking around where they were doing uh, rescue and recovery. But today, things have cleared up a little, they're gonna take me. So I'm gonna take the energy and your good uh, wishes that I feel out there into that area. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Ma'am Maria. Although we have confidence that she will do a great job in leading our city, but I want to remind you that
that she cannot do it alone. She will need your help and will expect to get your help. And please give her your help when asked for. Well. And if she doesn't ask, if you see the need, volunteer. I'm glad Senator Hannah Beth Jackson mentioned it because it is difficult to see out in the audience from here. I didn't want to mention it because I think you might would have thought it's my age that I can't see good. <laughs> Are there any other elected officials in the audience that I don't see? Okay, seeing none, so I don't think they are. Supervisor Janet Wolf and Supervisor Doss Williams had planned to be a part of the program, but they are involved in other emergencies in our community. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce the person who will be leading us through the rest of the program. She is a longtime Southern Marble resident. She is one of the civil rights pioneers in the African American community here in Santa Barbara. She is one of the founding members of the MLK Committee here in Santa Barbara. She has been the chair of the MLK SA Contest for 10 years. She is a current board member. For me to give you details on all of the accomplishments and contributions that she has made to make this beloved community better would take too much time. So will you please, with me, welcome our MC, Sojourn Kincaid Rowe. Oh, thank you very much. That's uh, very heartening for me uh, to have the affirmation of the community is, uh, is my reward for the work that I try to do here. And I really feel blessed to have been able to do as many things as I have done in Santa Barbara and the surrounding areas. So, and as always, I'm honored to be here today. I want to take time to thank the Santa Barbara Committee. I want to take time to thank Sojourner and uh, all of you who are present here now. I could not help but think that after such a rousing song, being a Baptist preacher, you want to preach. I'm just kidding. I hope y'all hope y'all enjoy for a mode. Well, to make a little bit more laughter, it's dangerous to put the mic in front of a preacher. We have come today to recognize America's greatest hero. But before I give an address, as I'm pitching for Dr. Lawrence, who could not be here, not only because of the conditions of the highway and the railroad and et cetera, but also because of praying with him through this time in his own family. And I'm, I'm happy to have the privilege to just pitch it. Uh, I want the uh, clergy to come out and uh, share in this time that we can expedite time as we go into unity prayer. So briefly, I will just say a couple things um, because it would take me a long time to share. So I just want to make one or two points. 
early in my life, God blessed me to live in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I had the opportunity to hear Dr. King preach. We had Dr. Fred Charlesworth, who pastored in the city to make sure that every pastor, preacher in that city over 30, 40 miles would be a part of SCLC. And from that, we had the opportunity of supporting Dr. King and his message and his vision for humanity. My second point is that we need to continually put feet to the situation that confronts us as a nation. And most of all, make sure that we who now are here will continue to make the dream alive. It can only be real if we are real. It can only be real if we put forth the effort as he left, as his most famous statement for me was, if I can help somebody, then my living shall not be in vain. If I can do my duty and help somebody, we will leave here and make sure that not only what we know, but our children and our children's children will not allow the dream to die. We can bring the dream into reality, but we need all of our help. And with that, you and I know that we have had and having nature taking a catastrophe upon us. And we've called to have community. Uh, prayer together, unity prayer, and we have each of them who are going to take part in it, and not because we just believe that prayer changes things. Thank you, Pastor Wat Watkins. Um, actually, we're not all going to speak. Um, we're just going to um, have a couple of, of comments. Um, but I do want to introduce to you the members of the clergy who are up here this morning representing the different faith communities in our congregation, uh, in our community. So you've already met Pastor Lewis Watkins um, from the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. This is Reverend Caitlin Cotter Coilberg from the Santa Barbara Unitarian Society. This is Father Brian Cox from Christ the Church. Uh, Christ the King, Episcopal Church. And behind me is Reverend Cornelius Florence from Bethel Church of God in Christ. Reverend Julie Hamilton, also from the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. This is Reverend Mark Richardson, and standing next to him, uh, Reverend Alan Stout, both from First United Methodist Church of Santa Barbara. And I'm Rabbi Steve Cohen from Congregation of B'nai Breath of Santa Barbara. And um, Julia, uh, Reverend Hamilton, is going to uh, begin. Let us begin by invoking the spirit of love and grace for those whose fate is still unknown, for the friends and families who are still anxiously waiting, for the tears that have not yet been shed. In this time of painful uncertainty, may they be held in the arms of love. May those who have been injured in body and spirit be held tenderly in this time. 
and may we all be vessels of compassion and kindness, knowing that our soft hearts, fragile bodies, and tender spirits are gifts unto this world. May they be put into good service in these times. Thank you, Reverend Hamilton. I would like to offer a memorial prayer for the souls of the 20 members of our community who perished last Tuesday. This is, I'll just be reading it in English. It's a Jewish memorial prayer, but I offer it to you, to all of you, um, as kind of a, um, uh, a vehicle or a, a you know, some sort of a um, assist to your own prayers on behalf of and in memory of the precious souls you know, from very, very young to people well in advanced age um, who died in the catastrophe on Tuesday morning. God full of compassion, grant a complete and perfect rest beneath the wings of the divine presence among all the holy and pure souls who shine as bright as the sky to the souls of our brothers and sisters who perished in the catastrophic debris flow last Tuesday morning. God of mercy, shelter them for all eternity in the shadow of your wings. May their souls be bound up in the bundle of life. May they rest in peace. Amen. It was said that um, they had asked Dr. King when he passed away, what would he want people to say about him? And he said, I don't want him to talk about all the awards that I won, the Nobel Peace Prize. He said, if you're going to say anything about me when I pass away, say that I was a drum major for justice. And he penned the words of this song, and I'm just going to sing a short verse of it. And at his funeral, Mahalia Jackson sung it. <clears throat> and it says, and you were sharing some of the words earlier. It says, if I can help somebody as I travel alone, if I could bring back beauty to a world abroad, if I could spread the message that the master taught, then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain. If I could help somebody as I travel alone,
For essay ages 6 through 12, the first, uh, we have two third place winners. The first third place winner is Connor McPherson from Montessori Center School. Our next third place winner for essay is Noah Slotnick Latrisco from Washington School. Second place, we have Noah Zaksevsky from Monte Vista School. winner for her essay entitled Speak Up is Olivia Battles from Roosevelt School. <laughs> Olivia, will you please grace us with your essay? Martin Luther King Jr. was a leader for a free democracy. With his vision, voice, and motivation of others, he promoted equality and peace. Dr. King inspired people to speak their thoughts and take action against injustice. He wanted a world where everyone would trust and enjoy one another, not because of the color of their skin or their gender, but their personality and beliefs. Dr. King and other activists have changed the world for the better, but there is still change to be made. It is a known fact that our great country is run by a democratic process. Everyone 18 or older has a voice in who leads our country and makes its laws with the right to vote. As opposed to other types of government, everyone can vote and every vote matters. Many of the early settlers came from England, a country run by monarchy. England had a king and queen and only select few created the rules and laws that all British people had to follow. One of the most important aspects of a free democracy is the right to assemble. The power of people in numbers is endless. It says what you think and have to say is important. The more the people, the more important it must be. It makes people notice, listen, and act for change. Another important part of a free democracy is the freedom of speech. While you may not agree with others' opinions, they have a right to them. Dr. King was famous for his speeches. People were inspired by his words and moved to take action. If we didn't have the right to share our opinions, democracy wouldn't work, and we would be back to people making decisions for us. The power of people joined together and the right to be heard are fundamental to our country's progress, growth, and success. Martin Luther King Jr. was an example of someone who used our democratic process of assembly and speech to make changes. Each of us, using our voice to stand up and speak out for what we believe in, can create positive changes. Treat everyone as we would treat ourselves. He fought to end social injustice. 
My dream for our world is we end all violence against people. Martin Luther King stood up for what he believed in. My dream for our world is that we were more like him. He stood up for civil rights. My dream for our world is that we could be kind to each other. Martin Luther King was a very smart man. My dream for our world is we could be smarter. He was very brave and strong. My, dream, my hope for our world is that we become even stronger together. We swim backstroke. We are apples and oranges. We have differences, yet we have similarities. Then tell me, what makes a human human? In the human pot of infinite diversity, there's only one certain answer, our voice. It is indisputable that each person has a thought, an idea, a perspective. And that perspective is, in and of itself, a voice. It is our belief. It is our opinion. It is the piece of our invisible sunglasses, a little part of the lens that we view our world through. Our voice rings through with each decision we make, each action we take. It is what makes us the people who we are and guides us to be the people who we want to be. But the question arises, who will hear our voice? Who will listen to what I have to say? Does our voice truly matter? I think we've all experienced this type of questioning at some point in our lives, and I don't think I'll be alone to say that in times of doubt and uncertainty, I think about Martin Luther King Jr. I think about the courage it took for Dr. King to speak up at a time when his voice was shunned the most. I think about the confidence it took for Dr. King to stand up for himself and so many others. I think about the unwavering strength Dr. King has for having faith in love and happiness in a time of darkness and hopelessness. I think about Dr. King's influence, how he was able to rally a crowd of 250,000 people and share one of the most inspiring speeches of all time, words that we still remember that we, still, that we still hold so close to our heart today. With his voice, with the people gathered around him who listened to his voice, he changed history. He saved lives, he lifted people up, he moved crowds. He created a world where we can accept, embrace, and cherish our differences. And in doing so, he opened the door for each and every one of our voices. If the right of assembly and freedom of speech were limited or denied, how could we ever fulfill our dreams? How could we ever follow Dr. King's path, shining light and hope onward? The power that we hold in our voices is undeniable. We have the potential to make a change, to live in a world that we all believe in. After all, we're human. Through all our complex differences, we are connected in the fact that we each have a voice and a purpose. It all starts when we make that decision to break the initial layer of fear and be unafraid to speak up. Whether it be a single poster, a single signature on a petition, a single spoken word, the right to free speech and assembly is our right, our human right. 
Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And for poetry ages 13 through 18, from Carpinteria High School, our first third place is from Max Carpole. The next third place is for Jeanette Fontone of Carpentria High School. Second place for Haley Schwasnick of Carpentria High School. And our first place winner goes to yet another Dos Pueblos High School student. We have Kundai Chicoero with her poem entitled, Follow the Legacy, which we will now hear. Follow the Legacy. <coughs> Anger, agitation, anxiety, and angst. Did we wind back the time? Did we take a step backwards? Tears, torment, tempers, and tension. Where do we start? How do we move on? Democracy is on the ropes. Indeed, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Times are tough, emotions are high. Let's hold on to Dr. King's dream. Let's follow the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Now is not the time to be drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. It is the time to make real democracy. Segregation, separation, discrimination, and domination. Now is the time to break free from the shackles of that which pull us down. These shackles can be broken. Push for justice, equality, inclusion, and peace. Days may turn into nights. Hatred surges, tension, and emotions get high. But follow the legacy we must. Say no to violence, hold on to the legacy. Democracy, justice for all, peace and equality. Diversity, inclusion, freedom, and opportunities for all. Dr. King handed us the baton. He started the emancipation race for us. Let us continue with this race. Let us not give up. The power lies in us. The power lies in our words, not our fists. Let us all be persistent in following his legacy. Tire we must not. For now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Justice for all, equality, inclusion, acceptance, love, and harmony. Let's follow the legacy. For, for through darkness the legacy shall guide us through. And pave way for the dream, now is the time. And democracy, his legacy will never die. Exclusionary institutions he fought against. Race, racial inclusion he fought for. Let's honor Dr. King's vision. Let's fight through love. He had a dream, he fought for a dream, he left us a legacy. Now is the time to follow his legacy. Let us keep fighting peacefully. It is the time to make real the promise of democracy.
because you, you do all things well. As we dismiss from this place, but not from thy presence. As we give thanks in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to ask you to depart, meet us, and continue our celebration. Thank you, and as we say, go in peace. Thank you.